actually running the command. So here's the toothbrush data. Okay, you can go down here and find out what the names are. I guess by going up there and finding out what the variable names are. Or you can just do this and just ask for names. You can go names of toothbrush. And then if you ask for names and run it, it will look I can ask for names to throw, and then it'll just tell me what the names of the variables are, and right down there. And then you can go about doing your homework, and how you do your homework is pretty much the same way you're going to do this data. That's another data set. But here the data set's not in the base, in base R, the data set's in a library called MASS, so first I have to load that library called MASS, you're going to have to do this a few times for different things because different functions and things are in different libraries. So I just run the, oh, here are comment lines. So if you want to write comment lines, if you want to write comment lines in R, you just, you just put the pound sign here. You just put the, uh, yeah. I just can't see the data. Um, <coughs> Put the pound sign and just say this is for comments. And then what happens is it won't do anything if I ask to run that. It just won't, it won't do, do anything, right? I'll just, I will just do that, right? So this is for comments. And this, if I want to run that line, nothing happens. Basically, oh, I'm down there. That's what I'm doing right here. You just get this line and just run that line, and nothing happens. Just say this is for comments, nothing happens. So now when I get over here, I can say, okay, I want to run that library mass. So I load library mass, and I ask for what cabbages is, and there's cabbages. It gives me all the things, and I go, okay. I can scroll back up and see what the uh, variable names are, or I can just run this thing here. Just put that and run that. And it tells me that the um, cult date, head weight, and vitamin C content. Okay? So, first thing I want is I want to get a histogram of head weight. Okay? There's lots of ways you can get a histogram. Here's the easiest way I can go just ask for hist the head weight, run it. And, uh, oops, you know what I didn't do? I didn't do this. If I just want to use the variable names, I have to do is attach it, and then what it does, if I use the uh, attach command, then I can just call things by the variable names without putting head weight dollar, instead of going head weight, uh, instead of going cabbages dollar head weight, I can just use the head weight command, and I can just go like this. Um, I can run it, and there it pops up in that window over there. Okay. So this is the graphics window over here. Well, th th this window serves for, for, for lots of purposes, but it's also the graphics. Um, you can get that. And I can go, okay, so there is the histogram for it. Now I want to put it into a Word document for homework. So I'll go over here, do this, open up. Where is Microsoft window? Uh, you can also, where the cursor is, you can just type Word and it'll pop up. Oh, well, it just pop up. Oh, Word 3.2.13. Okay, it'll work. So I get Word 2.13. get a blank document. Press the bingo. And then I can go, okay, I don't know which one is it. I can go uh, problem number one, the part A. Part A. I don't know, and then I could just go uh, uh, go back to R here, take this command that I did, and I can just go uh, do everything that I did. What did I do? I can just go, okay. I really want us to do it. Okay. Really want it. okay. I can just take this command over here, show me the command you use so I can edit your uh, code. Copy, go over there, go back to R. Over to Word. 
paste that in there, head weight, and go back to R. Then you have to click on zoom. Now I can go over here and save the image or copy. I can just copy the image. Okay. Go to copy image. Go back to Word. Paste it in there. And you're done. Right? Then you can resize it as you wish. Okay. You can do that. Then I go OK. Go back to R. I want to do that. Um, Comparative histograms. So I go, here's her two ways to do it. Okay. And uh, I, I can use the library lattice and then just use one little command, right? The thing I have to do is load the library lattice. And then you, the thing you can do is you can highlight both at once and run them both at the same time. Like that, like that. And then it gives me that graphic. Okay. So histogram. That, that function is un, is in the library lattice. This is in just the regular library. And then it gives me a comparative, it gives me a comparative uh, box plot like that. Okay. Um, thing I can do, and that's a nice simple quick command. Here's another way to do it. This is the way I do it a lot. It's a little bit more complicated, but not much. Um, thing I can do is I can go, okay. If I did it, okay, the thing I could do is go, okay, well, here, here's, here's one way to do it. If I can go, uh, how would I want to do this here? Let me see. Let me create it. Let, let me take this. Copy that out. Copy. Mm, lots. Give me a new file, new file, new R script. If I just did this, I just did this, the thing I said, I want a histogram of head weight, but I only want the head weight where cultivar is equal to C39. If I put an equal sign, if I just put one equal sign here, then it's going to assign C39 to cult for everything, right? But if I say equal, equal, it's saying, okay, it's going to only look at cult, it's going to look at head weight where cultivar is equal to C39. So if I plot this thing, it's going to look like that, and then I can plot it, I can plot that one. Now notice here, this goes from 1.5 to 4.5, correct? Now I do this one, and I say, okay, I just want a histogram of head weight when cultivar is equal to uh, C52, and I can run it. And now what happens? is this goes from 1 to 4.5, right? So if I compare the two, it's hard to do it. So the thing I do is go, okay, these have different limits over here. So the thing I'm going to do is I go back to this one, and I go, okay, the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make the limits, the x limits on each graph the same so I can compare them, okay? So if I do that, then I'll have everything, if I run it, let me run these one at a time. Then I can go, okay. So now here's the first one. And then I go, here's the second one. And you can see it's a little bit, uh, so now I have the same scale on each one. And I go, okay, that's good, but I still can't compare them easily. So what happens is in the graphic window, in the graphic window, unless I tell it otherwise, I just get one graphic at a time, okay? It's just, it's just, I, it, I just get one graph at a time. The thing I can do in R, it's very flexible, I go, okay, the thing I want, this is called a parameter command, and what I, what I want to do is I want to break the graphics window up into two windows, okay? And the thing I want to do is I can go, okay, so I go par, and so I go NF columns, is equal to, is equal to, so I concatenate two things, 
So I say I want two rows. So that C21 means I want two rows and one column. Okay? So I break my window up that way. And then what I can do is I so I can run that command. You don't see anything happen because it just broke up the window. And now what I do is I run this. Oop, we're gonna have to, I'm going to have to do is expand this a little bit. Tell your wife it's going to get upset. So I'm going to run that, and I get that. And then I'm going to run this one. And I get that. Now it's easier to compare these two, right? You can compare them. Now they're both at the same scale. And I can go, okay, this one is shifted to the left a little bit more than that one, right? So you can see it visually a little bit better. Scale's a big thing to do. You have, you have to be careful of uh, coordinates when you're comparing things. Okay? Now I'm done with that. And if I don't change it back to just one by one, if I don't change this uh, thing back, if I don't change my screen back to just one column and one row, I'm going to keep Every other graphic is just going to keep doing that until I change it back. So basically, so I just run that again and change things back to the default. Okay. So now when I do something, I just get one. So, so back here, I'll just get one graphic like that. Oh, we have to do it that way. But now I'm just going to run this one. What's the symbol after the M for the C39X limb? Is that equal? For C, after the C39, we're here? Yeah. It's X limb equals C? Oh, X limb equals C, zero uh, point. What's, what did I have? Yeah, X limb is C. So that means this X limb, this is the lower bound, and that's the upper bound of the X axis. Okay? Whenever you want to combine things, okay, here's how R works. If you want to create a vector, anyone know what a vector is? We don't know what a vector is. Did I, did I bring this in? <laughs> in just two dimensions, a, a vector is just like a... Uh, Day, I showed you how to, if, if you have a whole bunch of data, I showed you how to shove it into X, right? Mm -hmm. The thing I want to do is if I, if I have X and I want to create a variable X, I just concatenate all these numbers, so it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and I can just shove all those things into X, and X is just going to be, X is just going to equal all those numbers, right? And so the thing I'm doing here is so when I go C, when I go C uh, zero, what did I say it was zero to five. Now what I'm saying is okay, this is just what I'm creating. To say I put this into something called Y, I shove that into Y, and then Y is just equal to zero to five, and so it's basically it's just an interval here, it's zero to five, or, or it could be a point. In the Cartesian coordinate system, it can be the point zero five, or it can just be a limit. It's a, it's an interval from zero to five. In this case, R interprets it when I put x limb there. It interprets it as as an interval, but I want everything between zero and five for the x-axis. Okay. Okay. So did I run this thing? Why didn't that run? Didn't that run? It should be back to normal. Okay, now I want to make a say I want to make a box plot of head weight. Okay, that's easy enough. I just say box plot head weight, and I can run it, and there it is. Okay, 
There's the Vox Blood of Hedwig. Uh, make a comparative box plot of head weight by pulse plot. Well, box plot command is really flexible, so I can just go box plot, head weight, cultivar, and then what I so I put the first variable that I want over here, and then this would be by cultivar. So then I can give a comparative one, and it will give me it will give me that. Okay, so now I have a comparative box plot, or I can use the plot command. There's the general plot command. The plot command is very powerful, and you can use it for lots of different things. But in this case, what, what type of variable is head weight? Is it continuous or discrete? Continuous. Continuous. It's continuous. And what's cultivar? Is that continuous or discrete? Discrete. It's discrete. There's only two, two, two cultivars, C39 and... Uh, C52. So the thing you do is I can go, okay, so when the plot command looks at this thing and says, okay, I want head weight uh, plotted by a discrete variable. So it, oh, so when it looks at it, this one, it goes head weight, I want it by a discrete variable cold var. If I run that command, it gives me the exact same thing that this one does, right? These two are going to give you the exact same graph. Amazingly enough. <laughs> or, uh, now what happens if I use two bit now, now? So the plot command is smart. It goes, now I have this thing. I have head weight by vitamin C. If you go back and look at the data set, what, what's this? Head weight's a continuous random variable. And what's vitamin C content is a, is it discrete or continuous? Let's go back and look at the data. Okay, so we look at all these things. So what does it look like vitamin C is? Here's vitamin C, there's head weight. This has all these values here, right? The vitamin C content. Okay, so you can look at that and you go, well, okay, it's not discrete. So I go, okay, so I can plot it. So I go by this. So if I do this one, what's going to be the x-axis? So I run this thing. So I run it. And I, and I get this graph. Okay. So this graph has head weight by vitamin C, so it's by vitamin C, so vitamin C is on the x-axis, head weight is on the y-axis, or I could flip it around. Either way, I can do that, so you have to be careful with the plot command, what it is that you're running. So then I, if I do it that way, I get head weight would be on the x-axis, and vitamin C is on the y-axis. So be careful with that one. We're going to use the plot command a lot later, but right now, it's all you need. Now, how do I get summary statistics for head weight? Well, the summary command, you can run it, and you're going to get, get these results here. So if I want to copy that into my homework assignment, I can just go OK. I can just grab all this stuff just like that, grab it, and go OK, copy that stuff, go back to my homework over here. I don't know what part that is. This would be, whoops. And I can just paste that in there. There's that. Always give me the command so what in your homework so I can check what it is that you're up to. Okay. Then um, what else can I do now? Say I want to get the mean, median, mode, variance, and standard deviation. Well, these each have separate commands in R, so I can just do it that way. I can run all these guys at once and go, okay, presto, bingo, there they are. So I just ran all those things, and that'll give me all the values. Can't, couldn't find the mode, so I just said it was numeric. Okay, so you go over there, and uh, I can 
just take that, copy it, go back over to my homework, go OK, paste that in. And it'll give me all of that stuff. Alrighty. Um, I can go over to. Now say I want to get percentiles of the head weight data. Well, the thing I can do is I can go quantile. Quantile is, is sort of a percentile. Technically, the percentile is if you know everything. A quantile is you estimated from the data. That's the only, that's the only difference. The quantile head weight, say I want the 20th percentile of head weight. Then I just say, OK, I want the 20th. Uh, 20th quantile, so if I want the 20th percentile, that's the same as, so I say I want the, the quantile of head weight, and I want the uh, 20th uh, percentile, so that's the same as 0.2. I could run that and would say, okay, the 20th percentile is 1.7. And say I want the 75th percentile, then I could just go, okay, quantile. 0.75, run that, and it would say 75th uh, percentile is 3.125. So now I can go, okay, let's see. Say I want to get the 10th, 20th, 30th, all the way up to the 90th percentile of head weight. thing I can do is I can go, okay, quantile, and now I create a vector of all the percentiles from 10%, uh, 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90 so I say, okay, combine all those things together and run it. And then it gives me all the percentiles. Or, this is the way I'd probably code it. If you have to learn the sequence command, the sequence command just says, okay, let's sequence. I, I want to get a sequence of numbers from 10% to 90% by 10%. So I want to get a sequence of numbers from that, and I want to get head weight. I'm using the quantile command. So the quantile command, basically what it does, this is shorthand for creating what's above it. So I say, OK, let me sequence that stuff and run that. And it's going to give me the exact same results that I have there. All right. Now there's various ways of splitting up data. But if I want to find the mean, median, variance, and standard deviation of head weight by cultivar, the thing I can do is I can go by head weight. I say, so the by command, whenever you have a question on a command, you can always do this too. Say, how do I use the by command? The thing I can do is I can go down here and I can go question mark by. And then a window pops up. And it says, OK, here's how the by command works. It goes by, then I have to put my data in here, indices that I want to do it by, and the function that I want to use, plus a whole bunch of other variables that I might need or may not need. And so I can do that. And so I go, OK, so what's the data that I want the, the mean of? It's head weight. How do I want to break head weight up by the indices? I want to break it up by cultivar. And the thing I want, the function I want to use is the mean. So if I run that, it's going to go, OK. So it goes by, so it gives me the mean of head weight by cultivar. So for cultivar C39, it's 2.9. For cultivar C52, it's 2.28. And then I can just continue down with all these guys. So I can highlight them all like that and go run it. And it would give me everything. I can run it all at once. And it would give me everything there. So it would give me the mean. It would give me the means of all those things and everything by cultivar. Okay. So another way you could do it, I could do it this way. Let's see. Uh, this is more complicated. I can, I can go X. I can take X. And I can use the split command, I can go split, 
And we, me, we learn lots of ways to do, do everything. And in any programming, there are a gazillion ways you can do the same thing. So there are lots of commands to do things. Split it by cult. What's going to happen here? Oh, I got the right command here. Right syntax. So let's split it. Okay. So what it did is it split head weight by cultivar and shoved it into X. And so now X, what is X? X is this thing. X now this became now X has two parts. I can have X dollar C39, which is has C30 all the C39s in it. And then I can just go if I want to get the mean. If I want to get the mean of the C39 one, I can go mean x dollar C39. And it'll give me the mean of uh, C39. Or I could ask for the mean of x by uh, dollar uh, C52. And I can get it that way. But what is the way to get it? <laughs> so instead of going X dollar, so or anyway, I don't want to get into all that. But this, that, this is one way to do it. You can ask for it that way. Or I can just say X, is, X remember, is two things. So the first thing, I'm saying X, the first thing is C39. And X, the second thing, was C52. So I can access it that way too. Okay, through the homework. As I said, if I wanted one of the homework problems I gave you, I forget which one it is, but say you want to <coughs> get some data. <coughs> say I want to create a, a variable, I'll call it, uh, let's see. I'll call it XX. Okay. Okay, now when you're done, whenever you're done, whenever you're done with something, detach. Detach. Detach cabbages. Okay. If I detach cabbages and run it, then what's going to happen is whenever I use, now, now if I ask for a head weight, if I go down here and ask for a head weight, you have any idea what it is. Won't know what it is because because I detached it and headway doesn't mean anything to it unless I said cabbages dollar headway then then it would know what it is. Okay, so whoops. Now if I go cabbages dollar headway, it would uh, what the heck happened there? Uh, well, that's why. Now we now we know what it is. Okay. So when you attach it, when you attach it, I don't have to do that anymore. But when I detach it, then I have to. But thing you want to do is if you load a bunch of data sets, what happens the variable names may clash, and then it doesn't know which one is which, right? So if I had two variables that were the same name in each data set, then the last one that I used would be, would take precedence, it would mask the first one. So always detach something after you're done with it, um, if you attach it. Um, anyway, so if I want to put something in, I'll, I'll create a variable, I'll call it xx. If I get tired of writing X, I'll just call it XX. So if I just want to load a bunch of data into XX, what do I have to do? I just concatenate it all together. As I said before, I go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And so that's all that's all now shoved into XX. I can run that. And then if I ask for XX, there it is. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Then if I want the mean, of xx, I ask for the mean of xx, what is, what is it going to give? It's going to give me 5. Okay? So that's one way of rendering data. Okay? 
Here's another way to enter data. 1.25 is 89%. Right? If I ask for, now let's say, now let's say it's not normal 0, 1. Let's just say I want the probability that uh, x is less than uh, 6. Oops. I want the probability that x is less than 6 with a, when the mean is equal to uh, uh, 5 and the standard deviation is equal to 2, right? Okay, I want to find that. So it's not a standard normal anymore. So I'd go P norm. Uh, what do I want? I want 6. What's the mean? 5. What's the standard deviation? 2. I'd ask for that, and then it would go, I can run that, and then it would tell me that it is 69%. Okay. You with me? So P norm just tells me the area under the normal curve that's the area under the normal curve that's less than 6 when it has a mean of uh, 5 and a standard deviation of 2. And what's this telling me? It's telling me the, end, end of the area under the normal curve that's less than 1.25 with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1 is equal to, whatever it is that it says, 89%. All right, so that's easy enough. How about if I wanted? How about if I wanted this one? Say I want the probability that uh, x is greater than six. X is greater than six when mu is equal to uh, five and the standard deviation is equal to two. How would I calculate that? <laughs> How do you calculate that? Wouldn't it be one minus? Well, let's go back. Just draw the graph. Right here's a normal distribution. There is a normal distribution. <laughs> oh. Can you guys see? Can you see that? Yes. So it has a mean of what did I say it was? Five. A mean of five. So I want it greater than six, so six is say somewhere around here, right? So when I just ask for this area. It's less than six. I get this, right? That's what p norm. That's what p norm six five two would give me. Would give me this area, right? But now I want, I want this area. So how would I get that area? Wouldn't it be one minus p norm? Yeah, correct. <laughs> Just one minus that. Okay. Remember, the area under the curve always comes up sums to one. Yeah. So I just go one. Minus P norm. Oh, uh, what did I say? Uh, six. six. Five, two. Five, two. Okay, there you go. Uh, plus the bingo. Whoops. Enter. So it's 30%. So 30% plus that should be, that should, uh, this and this should sum up to one, right? Yes. Okay. Nine. How about if I wanted less than or less than or equal to six? What would it be? A number. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I told you this the other day. What did I? How many times did I say the probability? If you're a continuous random variable, the probability is equal to any one particular point is zero. zero. So. It was, 
probability that's greater than 6 or greater than or equal to 6 should be the same, right? If I just add one point, what's the area under the curve of one point? So I just added a point, right? So I haven't added anything, really, in terms of area under the curve. Okay, so there we are. So that's how we do those things. Uh, get back to the slides. So the probability of z is greater than 1.25 is just 1 minus that. The probability of z is less than minus 1.25. I just do that. The probability that it's between two numbers is I just find the area under the upper one. I, I get that. I find that area. And then I subtract off this area for x2. So I subtract off that area. Makes sense, doesn't it? Say I want it between six. Say I want it between six and uh, three. It's sort of like that. So I find this area, which gives me all that stuff. All right, so that gives me all the area from there down to here. And now I want it so it's between. So, it's, so if I want the probability that it's, uh, x is between 3 and 6, it's going to be equal to the probability that x is less than 6 minus the probability that x is less than 3. And then I subtract off this area which is this, and then that would leave me everything in between. Okay. Alrighty. Okay, now if I want to get percentiles of the normal distribution, that's pretty easy. I already showed you how to do that, didn't I? I would, in, in, in a previous slide, didn't I show you how to do that for homework? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I want to get, if I want to get percentiles, percentiles are always between zero and one, correct? Mm -hmm. So, if so I want to find the 99th percentile of Z, well, then I, these are, these, now these, you should, these values right here, the 95th, whoops, I want to go past that. This number and this number are, uh, uh, actually, that, I should have another one in there. 97.5, I should have it there. Um, but anyway. Some of these numbers you're going to have to remember, and I'll tell you in uh, the next week or two which ones you should commit to memory. And uh, But anyway, we can always find percentiles, and R is neat. That's the thing we want to do. What is a percentile? <clears throat> a percentile is nothing other than... Normal distribution, and say it has uh, some mean, and then I want to do is I say here's x p over here, and say p is equal to p is equal to 75 percent. If p is 75 percent, that means 75 percent of the data is less than that value. Correct. So if I want to find those percentiles, what is it? So for the standard normal distribution, it has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. I can go, OK. Basically, what you want is the inverse of, of, of P norm. And you can find it easily enough. These can be found by going, let's see, let me go back to R again. Go back to R, and the thing I can say is I can just use the percentile command. 
go, go. Quantile. Oh, I want to get, no, Q, Q norm. I want to go Q norm now, and I give it the percentile, say 75, and say it has a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, so it's a standard normal. What's the 75th percentile? Oops, let me run that. Oh, I don't want to run it. I want to get the run command up here. I can go run command. So that would tell me I want to be at point, point 0.67, right? So if this was 0 and 1, this had a standard deviation of 0. It's saying that XP 0.75 would be equal to, what does it say, 0.67? Yes. 0.67. So that means 75% of the data is less than 0.67. Okay. How about if it had a mean? How about if it has a mean of, uh, I can go Q norm. Let's go back. Uh, I want 0.75. Uh, 0.75 of, I'd say it has a mean of uh, 5 and a standard deviation of 2, then what would it be? Then Q number 75th percentile of that would be, I could not find, oh, that's bad, it would be Q norm. It would be Q norm. Q norm. Run it. That would be 6.34. Okay, so 75% of the data, if at if standard, if the normal distribution has a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of 2, then the 75th percentile is 6.34. So that's how I got these numbers here. I just said, okay, what's the first percentile? What would I type in back before? What would I type in to get the first percentile? I just use Q norm. 0 0.1. 0 0.101, right? How about if it had a mean of 5 and is a standard deviation of 2? 0.152. Yeah, 0.152. Okay. Non-standard normal distribution. As I said before, I can take anything that has, I can take any distribution that has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of sigma, no matter what they are, and convert it to a normal 0, 1. Basically what I do is I take the variable, subtract mu from it, so from every value I subtract mu, so basically that centers the data at 0, correct? Then I divide by the standard deviation, and then basically what it does is it makes everything normal 0, 1. And the thing you have thing you do in a normal distribution is since probabilities are always the same, all you're doing is changing the shape of the probabilities are going to stay the same after after transformation. Okay? It's just like shifting if if so if seventy-five percent of your data is below uh, 32 degrees centigrade, and say it has your temperature has a normal distribution, you measured everything in centigrade, then if I transform everything to Fahrenheit, right, then if I transferred 33 and I subtracted the mean and divided by the standard deviation of my temperature data, then whatever that value came out to be, then 75% of that data would still be below that. Fahrenheit value, right? So one thing I did is I just changed scales. I didn't change the shape of the data, I just changed the scales. Okay. Alrighty. So this is how it sort of works out. If I want the probability that x is less than x, say it has a mean of mu and a standard deviation of 5, I could use that, but this is also equal to that. So if I just take x, and I take x, change it to uh, standardize it, then the new standardized value would just be x minus mu over sigma, and I get the same probabilities, okay? So the percentile and the standardized scale would be xp minus mu, so what is xp? xp is just equal to zp times sigma plus mu, so that's how I get this. Just a little bit of math that I'm doing here, just a little bit of algebra. So it just shows you how things are 
the same from one scale to the other. I just have to have a change. I'm just transforming the data. Uh, okay. How do you find normal? If I want to find the probability of x less than x in XL, I use norm distribution, x mu sigma, and I have to write true. If I want the pth percentile in XL, I just go norm inverse. I put p, and then I give it mu and sigma. In R, I just use p norm. We did this already. I use p norm, x mu sigma, and I use q norm, p mu sigma to get the uh, percentile. Okay. Uh, you can use the normal distribution to approximate the binomial distribution. Because the binomial distribution, about less, how many parameters does the binomial distribution have? P, right? P is really just an average, correct? <laughs> Remember I told you I had one of the first day or second day about the central limit theorem. I said no matter what the distribution is, if I take enough data, the uh -huh. average always goes to be, the average is always normally distributed, right? So if you take enough data, you can estimate uh, a binomial distribution using a normal distribution. Okay. Um, I'll talk about that uh, a little bit later, but in general, you want to shy away from it unless you have really a, a humongous amount of data. Okay. If you're looking at something like a presidential election. Yeah, you have so many people casting votes, it's easy, and you can easily invoke the central limit theorem. But if you only have 20 data points, I wouldn't suggest doing it. Okay? I don't know why statistics won't keep doing it. But. <clears throat> anyway, and there are, other, there, are, there are adjustments you can make doing that, but I'll talk about that later when I start doing confidence intervals and things like that. Um, Example, suppose, okay, here's some examples from normal, normal distribution. Suppose blood fluid levels has a normal distribution with a mean of 104 of, of millimoles per liter and a standard deviation of 5 millimoles per liter. What's the probability that chloride concentrations equals 105? Say so everything's normally distributed, right? What's the probability that it's equal to 105? C zero. Good. <laughs> okay. Probably not. It's equal. Any any number is zero. Zero. If it's continuous. It's less than one one out of five. How would I solve that? What's the probability that it's less than point out five? Just tell me the R code that I put in. Okay, what's the mean? I want the probability that x is less than what? 105. 105, right? x, and how's x distributed? x is distributed normal. What does that have a mean of? 104. 104, and it was a standard deviation? 5. 5, okay. So I want this, knowing this. So I get P norm, 105, 104, 5. That'll tell you what the probability is, okay? So, so over here, the thing I want is I just get P norm. 105, 104, 5. What, what is this thing? It's the area under the curve, right? Mm -hmm. Oops, that button. It says it's, 50, so it's about 58% approximately. Okay. That is that. So then I go back to this thing again. What's the probability that the chloride concentrations differ by the mean by more than one standard deviation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Okay, so what's the mean? 104. 
So just write down what this thing means, okay? So the means 104. So I'm interested in x. Well, one side it's within within one standard deviation of the mean. So on the upper side, it's going to be the mean plus the standard deviation, correct? I want to know that, right? Then on the lower side, I want to know the mean minus the standard deviation, right? I want to know that x is somewhere between here and here, correct? That's all I really said up there, right? So what's mu? What's the mean? 104. Minus, what's the standard deviation? Five. What's mu? 104. Plus 5. So I want to know x is between 99 and 109. Correct? How would I solve that? I go back to R here. Let's see, do I have it on the next slide? You never know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then the thing you'd want to do here is go oops, escape. How would I solve that one? So I'd go OK. Go back here, go handy dandy R again. You can look this stuff up in tables, but this is so much easier. P norm. What did I say? It has to be less than 109. So I want 109. Correct. Uh, what does it have a mean of? It has a mean of 104. And 5. Right. And then I want to subtract. I'm going to go minus P norm. 99. normal distribution, for any normal distribution, this is a constant. This, for any normal distribution, the probability that it's the data is within one standard deviation of the mean is always 68%. Because it's just a symmetric distribution. Okay? So no matter what it is, 68% of the data is always between uh, one standard deviation away from the mean. Now we have certain problems like this that are going to arise. What time is it? 10.22. Okay. Um, the Rockwell hardness of a metal is determined by impressing a hardened point into the surface of the metal, then measuring the depth of the penetration of the point. So <coughs> the Rockwell hardness for a particular al alloy is normally distributed with a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 3. If a specimen is accepted only if hardness is between 67 and 75, what's the probability that a randomly chosen specimen has an acceptable hardness? So, what do I want to find out here? What's the probability that hardness is between 67 and 75? That's right. Well, I want to find out. <laughs> right. P norm seventy five So here I want to find out. So I know x. I know x is normally distributed with a mean. What did I say it was? Uh, seventy. Mean of seventy and standard deviation of three. Now I want to know what's the probability that x is between sixty seven. And what did I say? 75. So this is just going to equal the P norm. Uh, P norm 75, 73 minus P norm uh, 67, uh, 73. So I'm going to type that in and tell me what it is. Okay, that sounds good. 
That's done great. <laughs> All righty. Now we have another one. If the acceptable range of hardness is 70 minus C, 70 plus C, what value of C would 95% of all specimens have acceptable hardness? Wouldn't we use Q norm? Huh? No. This is what I'm you. So the thing I want to do is I want, I want, uh, what do I want here? A couple of ways to solve this, but. Here's sort of the one way to do it. So, it's symmetric, right? So, everything's symmetric around the mean, correct? So, here's 70, right? And so, I want some value 70 plus C. And 70 minus C. Now at 95% of the data between here and here, correct? Mm -hmm. So what value of C should I have? Well, the thing I do is I go, okay, I want this to be 95% of the data, right? Since I'm subtracting something, this is the same dis this is the same distance from here as this is this these are the same distances. Right, from each other, from the mean, correct? Mm -hmm. 70 minus C, 70 plus C, so that has to be the same. So how much, if this is 95% of the data, how much of the data is over here? And how much of the data is over here? Okay, so I want to find out what C is, right? So a couple of ways I could do it. Here's the easiest way to do it. I go, okay. <clears throat> I can go back to R here again and go OK. So let's see. So Q norm. So what's 70 minus C? 70 minus C just means 2% of the 2 but 2.5% of the data is less than 70 minus C, correct? Mm -hmm. So I go OK. So I go Q norm. Uh, so 0 0.025, correct? Is uh, and what, what did I say the mean was? The mean was 70. What was the standard deviation? Three. No, it wasn't 30. Three. Oh, three. Three. Sorry. <laughs> did I say three before? I must have said that. Yep, standard deviation of three. Okay, so I say that. So what's the 25th percentile? 64.1. Okay, so I know 70. So I know I know 70 minus C is equal to 64.1, right? So what's C? So C is equal to 70 minus 64.1, which is equal to uh, 5.9. So it's somewhere between somewhere between five point uh, C is equal to five point nine. So it's somewhere between sixty four point one and seventy five point nine. Everyone's turning somewhere.